Welcome, everyone. I'm Amber, the Public Science Events Manager here at the Bell Museum. We are so glad that you're able to join us once again this afternoon for our monthly edition of the online Minnesota Night Skies. With fall upon us and the days getting shorter, it's a great time to head outside with your family and look towards the evening skies. And so today we'll be exploring what can be seen throughout the month of October, and your guide for these observations will be Thaddeus, Bell Museum's Planetarium Educator. If you have any questions for him today, uh, we have a couple of ways for you to do that. We're going to try and leave our comment box on as long as possible, but if we run into some issues, we'll have to turn it off, in which case you can actually send us comments through the Messenger feature on Facebook. We'll be tracking all of those questions throughout today's presentation, and we'll answer as many as possible um, today. So uh, thank you once again for joining us. Thaddeus, take it away. All right. Thank you, Amber. Um, hi, everyone. Um, watching virtually here, of course. Uh, again, my name is Thaddeus. I'm a planetarium educator here at the Bell Museum uh, in the Whitney and Elizabeth McMillan Planetarium. And I'm very excited today to talk uh, about some of the things we're going to see in October. Uh, all throughout October, there's a lot of different things to see in the sky, uh, whether you're right here inside the city or if you're stargazing from a little bit further away. I'm going to load up uh, my planetarium software here. Today, uh, we are going to be using uh, some software called Stellarium. Stellarium is a free open source software. You can download it yourselves. Uh, it allows you to view the night sky from anywhere on Earth at almost any time, uh, going into the distant past thousands of years or thousands of years in the future. And uh, we've set it up here though, don't, don't get too excited. We're just gonna do it from right here in, in the Twin Cities. Uh, and we're looking at the sky in just a couple days. Um, I'm gonna leave the date and time up at the bottom of the screen uh, where it's 2020 10 one. And I'm gonna stay probably at least for a bit of it here at around 8.30. Um, 8.30 is about an hour and a half past sunset uh, as we look at the sky throughout the month. And that's a good time to go stargazing. Hour and a half after sunset, sun is well below the horizon. You don't have to deal with that light. So you've just got, ideally the stars above you. Of course, if you're here in the Twin Cities, we know we've got a lot of light pollution. So as you're looking at the view on your screen here, uh, you're seeing probably more stars than you ever get to see. Uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, hopefully you're also seeing a faint little band running up and down. Uh, as we look here, we also have our Milky Way, something you're definitely not gonna see uh, in the Twin Cities, not with our light pollution. But uh, some of the stars that we're seeing here are a little bit brighter, they're very easy to see. And so we're looking to the south. Again, pretty common place to start, hour and a half past sunset, looking to the south. And if you're looking sort of straight up in the sky from the south, there's three very bright stars. One over here is called Altair, sort of the lowest one down. One a little bit further to the west is called Vega over here. And then coming back up a bit towards the top of the sky, we have Deneb. Now these three stars right here, if you connect them together, you get a pretty simple shape. We've been looking at it for the past few months because we best see it during the summer. And so here, in fact, we do have the summer triangle. Now, it is fall. We had our fall uh, equinox just a few days, uh, we, about a week ago now. Um, but the summer triangle is still visible uh, as we go into the next uh, month or so. So you can still pick it out in the early evening sky, although it will set pretty quickly here as we go into the later evening. Now, these three stars are also part of three constellations, uh, three very familiar ones if you've ever looked at the sky. Uh, we have Cygnus, Lyra, and Aquila. So we have the swan with uh, Deneb up here. We have Lyra or the harp with Vega. And we have Aquila the eagle with Altair, Altair there. Now, uh, three, three constellations very familiar to you. Uh, but as you're looking here at this night sky, just on, on uh, October 1st, there might be something else you see. If you don't see all these stars, there might be something else you see. But to see it, we're actually gonna move around just a little bit. We're gonna move around and look to the southeast or the east-southeast because low on the horizon there uh, here at 8.30 on October 1st, we have our moon. <laughs> we also have a constellation there popping up in the background. But we have our moon and in fact, here on October 1st, um, this is our full moon. Um, the first full moon of October, we'll get to the second one a little later on. Um, but this is our full moon. Um, and uh, this point in time, as we look at the moon, uh, it is directly opposite the sun from the earth. So we're standing here on the earth, we're looking at the moon and the sun is right behind us. So we're seeing all of the moon fully lit up. 
And if you do get a chance to look at the moon, uh, it is here, the full moon, very, very bright. Uh, if you're looking at very closely, like here, try to get a piece of some sort of filter, a neutral density filter, uh, green or blue film, red film. Uh, if you have theater friends, ask them for some red uh, spotlight gels. I'm sure they have some. Uh, and bring that out to, uh, to take a look at the moon here closely. If you're just looking in your own eyes, though, it is so easy to see. Um, we have the dark maria on the surface, those darker areas, those seas, which were once seas of lava. We have the brighter highlands, the oldest parts of the moon, uh, covered in, in craters all across the surface here. You can spend a whole lot of time looking at the moon. And, uh, but we're, we're going to move on to other things as well here. All right. Now we're here looking still to the southeast and uh, still on October 1st. Um, but we can also see right nearby the moon, just a little bit over, our very bright moon, and a very bright, bright red spot. Now, wherever you are, even if you are looking at the night sky from Las Vegas, you will probably see this bright red spot. It is very, very distinctive. And if you're really looking there, it's also a pretty solid color. It's not twinkling. If you look at some of the other stars around, you can see them twinkle just a little bit, as stars do. Now that's a really good hint here that this is not a star. And of course the color is also a really big hint. Many of you have already guessed that this is Mars. Now Mars here is gonna be visible throughout October. Um, and just here on October 1st, that's already a pretty nice sight. But as we look forward into the month, in fact, as we get to October 6th, the Mars, Mars will actually be at its closest approach to the earth. So on October 6th, and I'm actually gonna go forward in time a little bit just to show its placement in the sky. And I'm going to go look later in the, uh, yeah, no, because that was our moon flying by there. So here on October 6th, it is just a little bit higher to the east, um, but basically the same place. Um, and it is going to be just 38 and a half million miles away, closest approach, like it's next door. Now that's October 6th, and that's a great time to look at it with a telescope, closest approach. Um, but you might also hear in the news another date. In about uh, five more days on the 13th, Mars will be at opposition. So just like um, we had our full moon there, on October 13th, the Mar Mars will be directly opposite the Earth from the sun. So we're standing here on Earth looking at Mars, and the sun is right behind us on October 13th. And it'll be, a, now, this isn't the closest approach. They're, you know, offset here. Um, Mars here will be, I'm sorry to say, 39,000 miles away. So I guess it's still probably worth looking at. Um, very bright in the night sky. If you have binoculars or telescope, I do recommend looking at it. Um, it is a hard sight. It is a small planet. It's only about a third the size of the Earth. So it, just with the naked eye or, or even with small telescopes, it, it's hard to make out a lot of detail. Um, people with cameras who like looking at Mars, who are able to spend lots of time looking at Mars, taking these long exposure shots, or people under very dark skies, or Truly, people who have a lot of free time on their hands, if you can spend several hours looking at Mars, you can start to pick out a little bit more detail. In some ways, it's very similar to the moon. We have the darker regions on the surface, some more the darker basaltic rock on the surface. But we also have those bright red areas, the, the dust, rusted dust covering Mars. You can also see down at the bottom there, just a hint of the southern polar ice cap on Mars. Um, there is a northern one as well, but Mars is tilted away from us right now. Um, it's in its winter season in the northern hemisphere. And so we see more of the southern polar ice cap right now. That is where there's frozen water mixed with frozen CO2, um, but new data released by the European uh, Space Agency, hopefully I'm getting that right, uh, has actually revealed the existence of small pools of liquid water underneath the surface, probably very salty liquid water. Um, they've been doing this using uh, radar mapping from spacecraft in orbit around Mars. Uh, so the existence of liquid water um, was suggested a few years ago using similar data. Um, and now we have really uh, pretty good confirmation that there is liquid water there. Again, though, below the surface and probably very, very salty. So if you're planning to go on Mars and to drink the water there, bring a good filter. Thaddeus, can yes. I in for just a moment? You can. 
just Please. wanted to let our audience know that we did end up having to turn off the comments. Um, unfortunately, we had too many people joining us today that were not interested in astronomy. Um, but we do want to provide an opportunity for our, our actual audience to ask you questions. So with the comments turned off, if you are interested in uh, sending us a question, go ahead and just directly message us on Facebook. Um, if you send us a direct message, we'll be able to read that and answer those questions at the end of the presentation. All right, great. So send those questions in by all means. Um, I'm more than able to talk for quite a while about the sky, but I also really, really love answering questions. So please send them in. Um, and I want to say too, if you um, are looking, if you're already got a water filter, you might be one of those people that like to spend a lot of time backpacking. Um, if you're really looking to view the night sky, you see some beautiful views of the night sky. Um, try to get to the Boundary Waters. It was actually just named a dark sky sanctuary site, one of just about a dozen in the world. Uh, the Boundary Waters uh, canoe area has some of the darkest skies in the entire world. Uh, it is, although I've not been up all the way into the Boundary Waters itself, um, I've been up north and the skies up there are beautiful. And once you get away from all those city lights, uh, it's well, it's absolutely magnificent. As I'm sure many of you watching already know, uh, it is a pretty popular place. All right, now as we're looking at Mars here, um, we actually have a constellation right around Mars. If you're trying to track it down, um, if you're not 100% sure it's Mars, um, there are a few bright stars around it, um, in particular the constellation of Pisces. So Pisces here is the fishes, and try to get the fishes up. There's Pisces. Um, and it's not the brightest constellation in the sky, but I do find it pretty distinctive if you can pick it out. Uh, it is just sort of a simple V here. And there's a bright uh, grouping of stars here that are called the cornet of Pisces or the head of one of the fishes. Um, so Pisces here can help guide you and help confirm that you are in fact looking at Mars over there. All right, now if we are looking, we've got Pisces there um, and we've got Mars, but if we swing back all the way to the south, there are two more planets that we can see uh, throughout October. And uh, it, we've been seeing them as well throughout the summer. Uh, they're visible here in mid-October right to the south uh, southwest. Um, they're they're going to be the two brightest points of light you can see. In fact, as the night goes along, um, or as the, excuse me, as the sun sets, they're going to be the first uh, two bright points of light you see to the south. Um, now, we've got a lot of stars here, um, but we can see Saturn and we can see Jupiter. So again, been visible for several months. If you were watching the stream in, uh, in September, um, I talked about Saturn and Mars, of course, um, still talking about them. They're still awesome. Uh, it's Jupiter here, the king of the planets. Ooh, flying right into it. Uh, the king of the planets here, very hard to miss. Um, along with its entourage of moons, we can see Io and Europa and Ganymede. And ooh, way over there to your left is Callisto. Um, so the four Galilean moons here, four of just 79 moons orbiting around Jupiter, along with dozens or hundreds of probably, probably hundreds of other small rocks on ice around the planet. And of course, Jupiter itself. Um, Jupiter is almost completely opposite of Mars. I was just saying in, in so many ways. Mars is about third the size of the Earth, kind of hard to make out a lot of detail on. on. Um, you really do need a good pair of binoculars or a telescope. Jupiter, on the other hand, our gas giant here, 12 times the size of the Earth, easily visible with binoculars or a telescope, and there is so much more here. Um, just as you see it, the stripes here, the bands, bands going across the atmosphere, uh, these are actually where gas is rising upwards in the, the whiter zones and then falling downwards in the darker belts. Um, incredible detail. You can see here a small little black dot now this, this uh, black hole here is not a black hole, it's actually a shadow. Um, this is a shadow probably from the moon Europa. So Europa here is just moving in front of Jupiter as it's orbiting around Jupiter and it's casting a shadow on its atmosphere. Um, and something again, that's relatively easy to see as we think about things in the night sky. And shadows, these, these transits are very common uh, with the Galilean moons, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto going around Jupiter in just a week or a couple weeks at most, um, we get a lot of opportunity to see those transits and those shadows. But if we take a quick look over at Saturn, I'll try to be quick. I usually spend way too much time on Saturn. Or in another way, I don't spend enough time on Saturn. 
the magnificent ringed world here. It's really just, I mean, you should spend, you should in fact spend all night looking at Saturn or at least the several hours that you can see it when it's above the horizon. You should go out and look at it. Uh, it is it is absolutely magnificent. Again, binoculars, small telescope if you have it. Um, Saturn and its beautiful ring system are so easy to see. Uh, they're still tilted nicely towards us, still about 18 degrees tilt towards us. Um, as we go forward in the next few years, that will change. Um, we'll see it tilted uh, sort of level to, or sort of tilting level to us and then a little bit away from us. Um, so we won't see the rings in great detail for in a few years, and that'll continue for a few more years. Right now, just don't worry about that. Go ahead and look at it right now. Um, try to look for some of its moons as well. See those labels there popping up? Uh, it has 60, uh, 82 moons, um, the largest confirmed number of moons in the solar system around a planet. And uh, we can see a few labels here, including way off to our right, or my right at least, uh, we can see Titan. Uh, one of the largest moon of Saturn, one of the largest in the solar system. I want to say the third largest, but I might be a little off on that. If you didn't feel like asking a question, feel free to message us and let us know if I got that one right or not. And coming back to our sky, uh, we still have nearby Saturn and Jupiter, a couple constellations as well, if you're looking here. Um, in particular, uh, over by Jupiter in this direction, we have Sagittarius uh, or the Archer. And Sagittarius here uh, is most easily found by this teapot shape here, because you've got a handle, you've got a lid, you've got a spout, and you can sing the songs to yourselves wherever you're watching this. Uh, over from Saturn, we have uh, the very small, or well, not, not a very small constellation, a pretty average size constellation, good number of stars. We have Capricornus, uh, this, the mere goat, basically, in the sky. It's... Uh, it's an absurd constellation, honestly. But when the Greeks put it together, they weren't asking me because it was you know, 4,000 years ago. All right. Now, let's see, there's a few more. Let's, oh, there's so many more things to talk about. Um, all right, yes, great things happening uh, as well if we turn our attention just to the entire sky. So if you're not going outside, if you're not trying to look for anything in particular, um, keep an eye out though, just look at the sky and take in the view and keep an eye out for meteors or shooting stars. So throughout October, we have two average meteor showers uh, called the Orionids and the Southern Torrids. Now these are average in that they don't produce a lot of meteors. Um, so we get maybe just uh, one every few minutes. Um, and, but they are happening over a long period of time, over several weeks. So all throughout October, you have sort of a, just a good, a very good chance of going out and seeing these bright streaks of light uh, across the sky. In fact, uh, just a few nights ago, when we were doing our uh, kickoff uh, for our uh, virtual stargazing uh, with our telescopes and our cameras, um, when we were going out and setting up, um, and we were just sort of just sort of out there, just enjoying the night, um, there were there were meteors happening again once every few minutes. Um, I was focusing a little too much on the telescopes and setting up equipment to notice that, but I was told the meteors were very nice to see. So, uh, you know, do better than me and go out and, and see these meteor showers. Again, the Orionids and the Southern Torrids, not the brightest set of meteor showers, not like the Perseids a month ago or two months ago, um, but still a really nice sight. Now, these, um, these constellations, they get their name, um, we can see the Southern Torrids over here, actually, I'm sorry, as we look to the east. These constellations or these uh, meteor showers get their names from the constellations that the meteors appear to come from. So if you could track all the meteors you see, um, some of them would come uh, back from one point in the sky. Um, and you might already guess, in fact, um, the names of the constellations. Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit later in the evening here. So we're here at 1.30. Uh, now, the Orionids, um, you can probably guess from the name and you can guess from what we're seeing here as we look to the south. Um, the Orionids is part of the constellation of Orion or the hunter. And the Torrids that we see here, the Southern Torrids, these meteors appear to come from the direction of the constellation of Taurus the bull uh, or one of the uh, enemies of Orion here in the sky. Now that's true for all uh, constellations or all meteor showers. They get their name because they appear to come from a certain part of the sky where we find a set of constellations. Uh, so the Tor Torrids, uh, Taurus, Orionids, Orion, the Perseids last month, uh, two months ago, were from Perseus. 
And in fact, we can see as we look here as well, a few more meteor showers. Um, Perseids no longer quite really active. Um, but in this part of the sky, we do have the Andromedids, a very small, very faint meteor shower coming from the constellation of Andromeda, um, as well as another set of Taurids from another uh, comet. Uh, and we also have around here ooh, the Arietids, which uh, should come from, uh, there we go, Aries. Uh, we can see Cetus over there getting in the way like a sea monster does. Now, out of these constellations, in fact, all three of them that we see here, Cetus is not the brightest, although it does have a, a pretty bright star here, Menkar. Um, Aries is a very small constellation. It doesn't stand out too much. There's just a few stars that make it up. Um, we can see Hamel here, um, Alpha Aries, one of, the, one of its brighter stars. Andromeda though, ooh, sorry, getting a little crazy here. Andromeda here is uh, pretty distinctive in the sky. Um, just a you know depending how you how you draw it, just not too many stars, but they are pretty bright. Um, we can see Miroc there and Almac, and then we should come up to Alpha Rats here. And these stars are a little bit more distinctive because we're just near the center. We're near the disk of the Milky Way. Um, we see that band here, so we just get a few more, a few brighter stars. In fact, if we come a little bit over from Andromeda, we also get the constellation of Cassiopeia. And Cassiopeia here, uh, very bright, very distinctive constellation, so easy to see. Um, you, you really can't miss it in the sky because it is just a bright, try to get it up here. There we go. It's just a bright W in the sky. Um, or if you're from a better state, it's an M. Uh, standing almost straight up and down here to the east as we look here in the later morning of October 14th, um, but will be visible um, even earlier on. I'm going to jump backwards in time. Uh, 9.30 here. Still looking to the east. Uh, Cassiopeia is still here. And again, as we go throughout the month, Cassiopeia will also be visible. In fact, as we go forward to the month here, as we come all the way to the 31st, um, we're coming up on the moon again. And we're coming up on a very interesting moment for the moon. The moon goes around the earth once a month. And in fact, that's how we get months. We get the word month from month. You all assume, I assume you all said that to yourselves at home. You can say it again. Here, here we'll try it again. So three, two, one, all right? Three, two, one, month. It's a fun word. Um, but a month is how long it takes the moon to go around the earth once. Um, now we average that out to about 30 days or so. And then of course we muck it up because we like changing calendars and there's a whole story behind that. Um, but the moon doesn't take exactly 30 days or exactly 28 days or 29 or 31 days. It takes about 29 and a half days to go around the earth. And the earth goes around the sun, not in exactly 365 days, but more like 365 days and a quarter. And that means that every so often when those two things sort of line up perfectly, the moon goes around the earth, not 12 times in one year, but it goes around the earth 13 times. And here on October 30, 31st of 2020, we are getting that. We are getting the second full moon in a month, the 13th full moon of the year. And that is known as a blue moon. So if you hear in the, hear in the news as it, as it happens on the October 31st, our blue moon, well, that's what it is. The second uh, full moon of October, the 13th one of the year. Um, or just if you might also hear this as well, a blue moon might also mean uh, the fourth full or the, the third of four full moons in a season. Uh, make sure I get that right. The third of four full moons in one season uh, as split up by the solstices and equinoxes. It's not any different. I, I mean, it, the moon, it won't look blue. Um, it won't it sort of won't be any different, um, but it's just a cool sight. And it's um, part of, well, it's just a cool recognition of the fact that our sky doesn't match up perfectly. Or our calendars, our numbers don't match up perfectly with stuff happening out there. Um, the universe is not that nice to us. Um, it's always just some fraction of a number. All right. Uh, now, while we're looking here, I want to pause. I think I've got about five more minutes for my time here. Um, what I'm going to do actually is just throw up as we're looking here, because there's so many more, a um, few more constellations. Um, they are visible. Some of these are visible uh, in the beginning, the first uh, part of October. Some will be visible a little bit later on. 
but a few more to point out. In fact, attached to Andromeda, I do want to point out Pegasus over here. Um, Pegasus uh, shares a star with Andromeda, the star Alpharats. Um, it has a bright grouping of four stars. Make sure we see this clearly. Um, now, in the summer months, we look for our summer triangle. So you'll never guess what we look for in our fall months. That's right, the fall square. Astronomers are so clever. All right, um, even here at the end of the month, we can still see that summer triangle over here. Um, moving around to our north, I will point out, because I know some of you have just been waiting and waiting and waiting to see this. Uh, looking over here, and uh, we'll bring down some of these constellations, we do have our Big Dipper. Uh, it's not so easy to see the Big Dipper this time of year. It is still above the horizon. We can always, it's always in the sky. But the Big Dipper down here, part of Ursa Major, uh, it is very low to the horizon. So I haven't had great luck seeing it, honestly, the past month, um, just because there's a lot of trees and buildings in the way. Um, but we can still see the Little Dipper and Polaris here, or Ursa Minor, the smaller bear, uh, in the sky. As well, looking over in this later part of the month, as we get even later in the year, um, if you're seeing a bright star in this part of the sky, if you're trying to track down Polaris, uh, try to take a look out for, or an eye, keep an eye out for Capella, part of the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer, or the giant blob in the sky. All right, uh, I do want to pause. Amber, have we got any questions? Have we, have we had any, any questions come in, um, pe things people are curious about? Yeah, I, I want to thank our audience for using the messenger uh, feature. Um, we have to come up with new and creative ways to, to do these things sometimes. Um, so we did have a couple of questions come in, four actually. Um, and the first one is that uh, someone had heard that we have a good chance of seeing Aurora Borealis tonight. And they're wondering if you can tell us more. Um, well, I'm actually going to do a, a quick little Google search here um, because we might, uh, we very well might have a good chance. I, I haven't, I haven't kept up to date on it, um, but I'm going to check one of our space weather sites and uh, yeah, it's looking pretty decent over there. Um, so if you do want to see the Aurora, if it, it looks like we have a good chance here, um, you're going to need to get pretty, pretty far away from the city, honestly. Um, the biggest problem with seeing the Aurora is light pollution. And that's the light pollution of both um, our city lights, and it's also the light pollution of our moon. So uh, we're going to come back to the 27th here. Um, and if you've been looking at the sky at all, you might have noticed um, just the past few days, our moon's been pretty bright. Um, here, in fact, uh, we're almost at a full moon because the full moon, for those of you who turned in early on, when is the full moon happening? If you missed it, October first. Um, so we're almost full. We're almost at the full moon, and the full moon is its own, is its own source of light pollution. Um, that's going to make the aurora harder to see. Just hands down. Sorry, I can't do anything about it. Um, if you do face directly away from the moon, it you know you will be looking at a darker part of the sky as we look here to the north, um, and that's where we'd see the aurora borealis to the to the north. Um, so I won't say you have zero chance of seeing it; it's just going to be a little bit harder. Um, if you are able to get out under very very dark skies um, whenever you can, it's always worth looking for the aurora. It's very hard to predict it. Um, we usually get sort of like you're seeing, you've heard today, we get maybe 12 hours notice of when it's gonna be really, really active. Um, so yes, that was a long answer. That wasn't even really an answer. It was a great question. And my answer is it's gonna be really hard to see it, but go out and try and see it if you can. All right. <laughs> Um, the next question actually comes from Thea, and it's a question that we get quite often, but I think it's it's important to, to answer it um, every so often. And that is, what are the kind of the closest places near the city where, where it's the best to go do some nighttime sky view? Yeah, um, so I would say the best places closest to the city are wherever you are. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot about dark skies, but don't feel like you have to be able to travel an hour, two hours away. Um, the, the best view of the night sky is one that you get whenever you can get it. Um, and whenever it's clear, because, well, we all know what the weather's like right now. Um, personally, uh, I'm, I'm actually right, I live right nearby the Bell Museum. Um, one of my favorite places to go is Como Park. Um, and so I always suggest if you just bring out Google Maps um, and take a look for 
just parks nearby you. Um, parks are really great um, because generally, even if they have lights around them, if there's a small field, you can get sort of the center, get sort of away from those bright street lights. And they also tend to have pretty good uh, open, uh, they also tend to be, you know, sort of fields. You have a good uh, viewing area of the sky. You're not surrounded by trees and buildings, or they're not so close to you. If you are able to get a little bit further away from the city, um, oh, and I should say um, a great park uh, crowd favorite as always is uh, Theater Worth as well. I'm just a little bit out to the west there. Um, if you are able to get a little bit further away from the city, I've had really great stargazing uh, up in Stacy, Minnesota. Um, there's a big baseball field up there that I've never been kicked out of. Um, I'm not, please don't break any laws. Just, you know. Um, there's also a great stargazing place um, right off of uh, 295th Street. Um, it's just sort of a small pull-off um, in a small field. And it's it's a great, just a nice place. You can see the Milky Way from there. And that's about, oh, 45 minutes away. Um, even further away, um, I've done some nice camping in Rum River State Forest. Um, and that's had beautiful views in the night sky. But that is getting now about an hour and a half away. Um, and truth be told, you do get really nice views that far away from the city um, because you don't have all that light pollution. But again, the best viewing is going to be where you are, when you can get out and see the night sky. Um, and the more chances you take, the more you're going to get used to seeing things and finding things. And trust me, if, if you go out, um, if you go out 10 times in a week, you're going to see more than one person who goes out two hours away once a month. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next question actually comes from Amanda. And Amanda has a question from her third grader who's wondering about the moon and is wondering why we see the moon in different colors sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a really great question. So I, you know, I'd mentioned there that um, early on we don't, the blue moon is not going to look blue, except that sometimes you might see the moon looking a different shade. It's not just white. It's not just gray. It's maybe a different shade. Maybe it does look a little blue or uh, maybe it looks very reddish. We get different colors to the moon for many different reasons. The biggest reason, though, is our atmosphere, our air. So right now, if you take a really big, deeper breath air, and you just breathe in, you're breathing in air. And that air, it surrounds the entire Earth. And when the light comes through that air, the light from the moon comes through that air to our eyes over here, that light gets broken up and scattered. And some of that light doesn't reach us. Some of the blue light doesn't reach us, for example, especially when the moon is very close to the horizon. So when all that light comes to the atmosphere and- Thaddeus, I'm not sure that we still have you. I think that maybe you've completely frozen up. Um, so I just want to, it looks like maybe we've lost the connection um, to Thaddeus. Um, I hope we were able to answer most of your questions. I apologize that we weren't able to get some of, to some of them. Uh, we will go ahead and, and respond to those through Facebook Messenger. Um, so I do uh, want to thank you for joining us today. This is something that we do monthly um, to help explore the night sky. And our next program is scheduled for October 26th at the same time, 4 o'clock p.m. Um, I would also encourage you to check out the Bell Museum's website. There's lots of information there where you can download your own star map uh, and also where you can uh, go ahead and learn more about our Constellation Hunters programs and, and upcoming programs around the statewide star party. So we are very thankful for you joining us today. These kinds of programs are possible because of generous donations. And if you are in a position where you would like to donate to the Bell Museum, uh, please do check out our website for more information. Uh, thank you once again for joining us today, and we hope that you have a fabulous rest of your afternoon.